We'll proceed with the last section uh, for Second Corinthians. This is was our three-week agenda. We have done two weeks already. And uh, for our third session today, we will be, so we covered what Paul was addressing in the past, talking about and addressing past misunderstandings and uh, uh, issues with the church. And uh, then he went on to talk about a present uh, project that he wanted them to complete. And then now we're going to talk about the future, uh, the future um, where he will be talking about his coming to the church in preparation for his coming to the church. Okay, so it's three, this is the third section. Um, and he he handles uh, the bulk of the, the, the chapters uh, for today's session. Um, you would see that he handles his opponents in a more direct way and also talk, uh, yeah, so very, very different style. And chapters 10 to 13 seems like there's like a sudden change. And most scholars uh, agree that there's a change in the tone, in the mood of the letter from actually chapter 10 onwards. It's like as if, you know, it's disjointed from the earlier sections. The earlier sections um, showed, yes, there were differences between Paul and the Corinthians, but those differences um, were overcome. And you know, Paul did rebuke the Corinthians in the earlier chapters, but with the hope of reconciliation. He was seeking reconciliation. So his tone also was careful, was diplomatic. And when he went into the part about the collection of funds, he was encouraging them uh, in, in uh, collecting. So the, uh, an encouraging tone. But from chapter 10 onwards, it seems as if Paul is like in a fighting mode. It's, it's a different tone and there are differing views from scholars uh, on this and they, they think that it could be a different, a totally different letter. That's one of the view. Uh, or there are other explanations that um, why the sudden disjoint, even if it's a singular letter. So we're going to look into that. So for scholars who hold that it's a view of the view that chapters 10 to 13 is actually a totally different letter. The view is that it is better to treat these chapters as a separate letter. Okay, so that means chapters 1 to 9 is one letter and then 10 to 13 is another separate letter, which also means then that if chapters 9, 1 to 9 is are one letter, uh, the ending part of that letter, the original ending is missing. Okay, because it's hanging, right? And then chapters 10 to 13, if that is a separate letter, it then means the original beginning part of the letter no longer exists, is missing as well, right? Uh, and uh, these are two separate short letters. That's one view, okay? And the other view that, oh, it's a whole letter, it's a continuous letter. Now, there are varying explanations that uh, different commentators and scholars take on it. So some of the examples could be uh, the explanations are that, okay, Paul was dictating uh, chapters one to nine, dictating, uh, and, you know, he had a scribe, usually that was the case. And then uh, until chapter nine, verse 15, and then he resumed uh, there on the letter in a different spirit and a different mood. Okay, that's one explanation. Uh, some said that he wrote until chapter nine, and then he received Wow, suddenly he received fresh news and information about the church in Corinth, the situation there. And then so then he continued writing and dictating uh, the rest of the letter. And so therefore, knowing the news, you know, there was that sudden change in, in his tone and his uh, address. Another explanation was that um, he intentionally reserved his criticism till the end. So praise first, encourage first at the beginning of the letter, then the end of the letter, okay, score, rebuke, and a uh, harsher tone. And then one more uh, um, explanation is that actually, oh, chapter 1 to 9 is addressing the whole Corinthian church, but chapters 10 to 13, he's addressing specifically the opposition and opponent opponents and then hence that's why there's a different tone uh, in the letters so you have one view that it's totally separate different letters another view that it's actually a continuous letter but with reasons why there was a change uh, in the tone there is another view that is kind of like a combination between these two uh, views in uh, that explanation that view is that oh actually chapters one to nine are written over a period of time right? Uh, not in one sitting. 
Then after Paul finished these, uh, the letter from chapter 1 to 9, before he could send it, he actually received very distressing news of further problems in Corinth. And so that made him then, before he sent off that letter, that made him then continue write some more. And that would be chapters 10 to 13. And then he decided to send all of it the whole 13 chapters together as a single letter to Corinth. So these are some different views uh, on the, the, uh, the whole of 2 Corinthians and explanation of the differing tones um, and you know the sudden jump as well from chapter 10 onwards. Now, uh, for our final section today, chapters 10 to 13, there are three main sections, actually. Um, so the first part, Paul deals with his opponent's accusations against him. Okay, so that's where, you know, people say the opponent is very strong, it's in fighting mode, he's rebuking. And then um, the next section, chapters 11, all the way until half of chapter 12, okay, Paul very unwillingly and very uncharacteristically of him boasts of himself. He boasts of his credentials, his authority. He doesn't want to do this, but he brings it up because uh, his opponents provoke him. Right, So he, he, he has to defend. And then the third section, the last half of chapter 12, right up to the end of chapter 13, he talks to about you know, prepare for his third visit to Corinth. So these are the three chunks that we'll be uh, visiting today and we'll be talking about. And then there'll be sub uh, sections in between. Okay, so um, one of, again, another very good uh, inductive Bible study method uh, technique is in part of observation is to, when we read scripture, we ask ourselves the five W's, one H, right? Where appropriate, where possible, uh, read inquisitively, ask ourselves, who, who are the players involved? Who is there? What is the issue? When did this happen? Where is it happening? Why and how? And these really are the building blocks for observation uh, in order to have correct interpretation. Okay, so now Paul, so let's talk about the who, who. Paul is now addressing uh, a certain unnamed people, and those are the opponents. He doesn't name them, as well as the whole congregation. Uh, and these unnamed people in the church, and he's warning the, the Corinthian church about these people and their attitudes, these opponents and their attitudes. Okay, And uh, these people are claiming to be apostles of Christ, they are eloquent. They are putting themselves as authority figures of the church that the church should listen to. Okay, so therefore he feels that he needs to address it. Um, Paul had to address them because they were destroying his reputation. They were speaking against him, and there was false teaching. So that's why he had to um, take on uh, the opponents straight on. Now when was the occasion okay uh, it was when he's with them when he's away with them these are some of the comments that uh, and accusations that the people had so these unnamed people they accuse Paul of you know being courageous and bold when he's away from them writing very severe and strong worded letters but when he's with them oh he seems like eh, he's timid he's unimpressive in speech as a person so what they were accusing him was hey you in your letters are uh, you talk big you know but in person you are you're nothing your words are so feeble so that was the accusation against him now paul here then starts off to say um, that he's willing to exercise spiritual authority in person he is uh, in verse 11, he says, uh, in letters and in persons, um, they, yeah, they are the same. He's the same. But his approach is to take on the example of Christ, to be a servant leader, to have the meekness and gentleness of Christ, which unfortunately was misunderstood as timidity. And that's how the world sees it today, right? Uh, now even, you know, wow, if you want to make a point across, we have to wow, be very aggressive, assertive, bank table, wow, flip table, wow, then you can get the attention, you know. But if you come in very meek and, and, and soft-spoken, wow, sure you know, in the secular world, that's what people say, right? Um, but 
Then the next section, okay, so verse 3 to 6. I want you to take a look at these pictures first to get in context, okay, before we go into verse 3 to 6. So this, not sure if anyone knows what this is. Um, I, if I pronounce it correctly, it's the Go Ryo Ka Ku Fortress in, in uh, Hokkaido. It's a fortress, okay, a star-shaped fortress. And um, it's designed star-shaped because it's supposed to remove all your dead zones and when the enemy attacks, you can actually attack your enemy from, from all sides and all angles. And look look at these high walls. Okay, these are walls. There's a there's a water around the bolt around it. Um, there's um, high towers, lookout points like this, uh, throughout the whole fortress. Now there are other star fortresses also in the Netherlands, France, um, US, Italy, Canada. So such designs. You see them both in Asia as well as in Europe, America. Um, now, these star-shaped fortresses are a bit considered more modern design, modern technology. What about ancient fortresses? So, this one uh, is a Greek castle, uh, an ancient fortress uh, of Agostina, I think, if it's pronounced that way. And it's estimated to be built around the 4th and 3rd BC. Again, look at the picture. Observe what is the design of the fortress. What do you see? It's rubble now. Yeah, uh, it's a lot of rubble. But they're based on the remains, you can imagine what it originally looked like. What are some of the key features that are similar to the star fortress in Japan? Uh, so even though the shape is different, but there are some same similar key features. And then, of course, we have this ancient stone fortress. This is the Masada in Israel. This was built by Herod the Great. And he built this as one of his safe houses to escape uh, in case uh, in the event of the enemy attack. Again, look at uh, the features of this fortress. What do you see? High towers, high walls. All right, keep this in mind when we come to the next few verses. And we're looking at chapter 10, verse 3 to 6. So in chapter 10, verse 3 to 6, you see that Paul uses military language, military metaphor. And he highlights that there is a spiritual warfare that is going on here. And the weapons of this warfare are spiritual, not physical, but spiritual. And he uses this uh, military image, like having to capture a fortress. So what we saw just now, right, those pictures of the fortress with high walls, uh, lookout towers, high towers, um, very fortified. You know, you need to be able to capture this fortress. You need to scale the high walls, pull down these towers, take the prisoners captive. Right. So when attack attacking in war, but uh, as a metaphor, uh, addressing um spiritual warfare, what are the fortress and strongholds that Paul is talking about here. So he mentions in the verse, if you observe, arguments, right? So what are arguments? Reasoning, excuses to justify and rationalize sin, worldly, intellectual, philosophy, ideology. Those are kind of arguments that we have today. Uh, lofty opinion. Okay, and what lofty opinion would be pride. Pride of ourselves, pride of our own knowledge and abilities, um, arrogant claims and boasting, which is exactly what the false uh, teachers were doing, the so-called super apostles or that in Corinth. Thoughts like sinful thought patterns that uh, we may have. Disobedience, okay, then willfully disobeying Christ's commands. And that was what the Corinthian church was doing. And so he is using this uh, military warfare language to address um, having to attack and pull down all these things uh, pride, thoughts, disobedience, arguments, and all. And then we know we have spiritual weapons, right? Paul says in verse 3 that there is divine power. Now, what kind of divine power? Uh, Paul also uses other military metaphors in First Thessalonians, Ephesians. We know that there's the whole uh, armor of God mentioned out there uh, in terms of our spiritual weapons against uh, this spiritual warfare. Now, why does Paul suddenly bring in the use of military metaphors in, in this section? So some commentators say that 
according to um, historians like Josephus and Philo, uh, in terms of ancient practice, there are actually some rules of engagement when it comes to international relations. So if um, an ambassador of one country is mistreated by another country, it actually constitutes an act as an aggression of war or an act of war. So Paul here considers himself an ambassador for Christ, right? But when the false apostles mistreat him, oppose him, that's actually an act of war. And so therefore, Paul is then coming to say that, okay, it's act of war, I'm coming uh, in warfare, but not physical, but spiritual warfare. Therefore, he brings all these in. Now, Paul's opponents were using themselves as the standard to compare. So they were putting themselves as the correct standard and they criticized and put down everyone else. So as my husband's army friends like to say, gaki uh, kong, gaki song, right? Own self say, own self feel good. So um, Paul was saying, you know, it is foolish and unwise for the Corinthians to compare Paul and his co-workers uh, based on these false apostles' criteria and standard. And uh, he he chides his opinion, uh, opponents for boasting about themselves. And even though the, the work was done by other people in building up the church, planting the church, in uh, discipling the people, but these opponents were boasting that, oh, they were the ones that they were claiming credit for it. Uh, and yeah, and they were boasting how oh, the Corinthian church was so vibrant and so spiritual because of them, when actually they didn't do anything. Yeah. Uh, and so they were claiming credit for things that they didn't do. And Paul called them out on that. And so Paul said, you know, if you want to boast, boast in the Lord. Don't praise yourself. And he quotes Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 to 24. And let me read that for us. It says, Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. So Paul's opponents didn't know the Lord. Their self-praise shows that they have that fundamental lack of understanding. And only a person who, whom God praises and commends is the one who is approved. So what is most important and what matters is not the one who praises himself or even gains the praise of other people, but rather uh, is commend the person is commended by God. And so the praise and approval of God is more important than the praise of men. And so that's the summary uh, in chapter 10. Okay, and It's really about Paul's authority is from Christ, not from men. And if you want to boast, boast in the Lord. So keywords are being bold and boast. Right? We're going to move on to the second uh, segment of uh, this section uh, of these last verses. Now, when he said, I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me. What does he mean? Well, actually, he's saying that, oh, you know, indulge me in my foolishness. Okay, indulge me a little bit more. Listen to my appeal a little more. And that's why he was saying to them. Now, he had a, a godly jealousy for the Corinthians, especially when they were in danger. And he's not jealous of the so-called super apostles and the, the opposition, but he was jealous for the Corinthians to be loyal to Christ. And so in this section, Paul does boast in certain areas to defend himself. Now, the Corinthians were led astray. They were believing and they were impressed by these seemingly super apostles. And Paul says that they were cunning, like how Satan deceived Eve. So these uh, super apostles were deceiving the Corinthians. And he warned the Corinthian church about listening to a, a teaching of a different Jesus. Not sure how or they were actually they were Judaizers, so they were mixing up um, the gospel truth with Judaism, right? Uh, there was a, he's saying to the Corinthian church, "Be careful of a different spirit, a different gospel message." 
beware and compare that to the initial preaching that Paul, he himself taught that. And um, verse 5 to 6, yeah, Paul was actually willing to admit his lack, his deficiency. He was saying that, yes, I lack professional training in speaking, in skills like rhetoric, you know, unlike these uh, well-spoken super apostles, but in the knowledge of Christ and in the word, he knows his stuff. Okay, so that's what he was uh, saying. No, he's not an inferior apostle to these false teachers there. Then he goes on to talk about more accusations, uh, defend himself against more accusations against him. Now, Paul was financially supported by other churches to go on the missions to Corinth, okay, when he planted the church in the second missionary journey. Um, but when Paul was in need, he didn't receive any payment and gifts from the Corinthian church, but he supported himself. Um, so if you remember in Acts, if you refer to Acts chapter 18, verse 1 of 5, he was actually a tent maker. So he worked in the trade uh, while being a minister and while teaching the Corinthian church because he didn't want to be a financial burden to them. So these false apostles at the Corinth church, they were actually criticizing Paul because they were making money out of teaching. They were getting paid to teach uh, and to speak to the church. And so their rationale uh, of these uh, these opponents was that oh we are they are the true apostles because they were getting paid you know and Paul is false because he didn't receive any money and isn't that so like what the world's idea of what is true or the or the value of things now is based on monetary value you know oh pay then it's good if it's free uh maybe not so good yeah and. Even more, if it's expensive, yeah, it must be good. <laughs> and so Paul uh, compares these false apostles to Satan, who was uh, in disguise and is there to deceive. But in the end, the true nature of these uh, false teachers will be seen by their deeds. Okay, So those whose end will be according to their deeds. And so... I want to pause here. Um, it's good to have knowledge to know what Paul was talking about, the context and, and all that. But good for us to pause for reflection and application for ourselves as well. So these questions for us to think about, when you look at your deeds, what do they tell others about you? You know, Do any of your deeds, your actions, your, your whole life, does it send a, a mixed message of who you are as a Christian? And is there anything that needs changing? So these super apostles during Paul's time, they were saying things in one way, praising themselves, claiming certain things, but their actions didn't show for it. And so this is something that challenged us as well. Um, do our deeds and our life show and demonstrate that we are disciples of Christ? And if there is a lack in any area, um, is there some things that we need to put in place to change for ourselves? Now, then moving on, uh, verses 16 to 33. Okay, so then Paul continues with his, his version of foolish boasting as to the boasting of the super apostles, right? Uh, and then, so he's saying to them, you know, since you listen to boasting of the super apostles and, you know, you think you're so clever, right? So verse 19, it says, For you gladly bear with fools, being wise yourself. So I'm paraphrasing. Uh. Yeah, you think you're so clever. Okay, you listen to them. Uh. Okay. Uh. So Paul's kind of being sarcastic here, right? But actually, you know, he's he's saying to them, no, actually they are, they are using you. They are manipulating you and taking advantage of you, new Corinthian church. So you want to listen to boasting? Okay, so here's what I'm going to boast about. And then, then Paul goes into this boasting and he says, yeah, they say they are Hebrew. They are Israelites. They are descendants of Abraham. They are servants of Christ. They say, well, so am I. I am of the same nationality, of the same heritage. But instead of boasting about greatness and credentials and all the good things that was what the, the false apostles were, were doing, Paul boasts about suffering and boasts about service unto Christ. So this is a whole list you can see of what he has 
he went through uh beating stoning shipwrecked uh, uh physical danger whether he's in the city or whether he's traveling in the wilderness so really a lot of suffering that he has gone through and he boasts about that he boasts about that all that because it's his service unto Christ that he's proud of and then he goes carries on in in the next part of his so called boasting right of his supernatural the supernatural experience okay so we're into chapter 12 um, verses 1 to 10. Uh, and he stresses, you know, that he has no choice but to bring up something uh, which he has never mentioned before, but because, you know, they question his authority and his spirituality, so um, then he has to so-called boast and talk about this supernatural spiritual experience, and even though, you know, it actually does not edify the church or... Uh, have any personal gain for him. That's why he kept it to himself. And all this while, he has not spoken about it. Uh, and so he says, yeah, about, um, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. So a little bit on what's the difference between visions and revelations. So in looking again at the original language, uh, these are some definition of what visions mean. Uh, so it's a supernatural event. Uh, it could be in physical body or out of body, a uh, spiritual uh, uh, it happening. Uh, that's something that impresses on the mind. A vision, you see something, you could be in a trance. Okay, so that's the vision. Now, revelation, uh, the original language, the Greek is apocalypsis, is based really, the definition is really simply a revelation. It's God's unveiling of information. So uh, actually the, the word apocalypse that you know we often hear now somehow gets associated with like, oh, doomsday, end of the world, that kind. But that's not what the original meaning of the word apocalypse means. It just simply means revelation, right? Nothing to do with doomsday uh, in, in itself, that particular word. It, so it's something where God, unveils and reveals what was previously uh, concealed. That's apocalypsis. Okay, so then he goes, again, we're going to apply our, our five W's and one H, right? And ask ourselves as we read this passage. So who is this man? He says, I know a man. And what is, what is third heaven? Um, what was he told? So as we read this, ask ourselves this question. Now, when Paul says, I know a man, Paul is actually uh, speaking of himself in the third person. May, and commentators have said that maybe he, he, he did this to avoid boasting or sounding proud, like, oh, I was this, this, this. So he already feels very uncomfortable boasting already and talking about this supernatural experience. So he, he does it in the third person uh, point of view. All right. Um, and he doesn't want to come across like a, a very special Christian. So when did this thing happen? And he's very specific. He says 14 years ago. So 14 years ago, the Lord gave him a vision. And he's not sure whether it was a bodily experience, really his physical body, or it's just a spiritual experience, okay, his spirit. Uh, and where he was caught up to the third heaven. Okay, or in verse 4, it says caught up to paradise. Now, let's understand what is, how come God, third heaven, does that mean God, many layers of heaven? Um, so according to uh, ancient cosmology, and this was the ancient times, this was how they understood the creation, how they understood the heavens and the earth. And this was how Jewish literature also uh, put it across. Okay, They refer to the heavens in three ways or the three sections or types of heaven. Um, and... First heaven is where, you know, there's the clouds. There's the sky and the firmament. Firmament, firmament. Okay, we see that in the next diagram. In Genesis, when God created, he, he talked about this. He created the sky, the clouds, the firmament. Then there's the second heaven, which is above the firmament uh, and divides another heaven. And then there's the third heaven. Or it is also known as the highest of heaven. 
uh, in biblical, in Jewish biblical cosmology, this is often referred to as the place where God dwells, the highest heavens, right? In our Psalms, we read that. Now, when Paul was talking about uh, paradise, he could be using it synonymously with uh, third heaven, the highest heaven. Okay, so in your diagram, this one, you can see how um, the ancients people understood uh, the earth. So they believed that the earth was actually a round disc shape that was floating on an expanse of water. And the firmament, which is this dome, I'm not sure that you can see my mouse, but this dome shape that is across, it's like a cover, a bowl that is overturned and put over uh, the earth. Okay, and um, yeah, that's the firmament. So the the first heaven is where here, over this part here, you see the clouds. This is the first heaven. And so the waters above the firmament, and this area here is the second heaven. And then, of course, the heaven of heavens is where uh, they believe that God resides. So just a little information about how uh, the ancients viewed the heavens and the earth. Okay, and that's why Paul referred uh, to that third heaven there. So we understand a little bit about, you know, what he means. Now, we carry on with our uh, five W's, right? Okay, so what is the vision? And we clearly know Paul says uh, here, he cannot speak. It is beyond words. And not only just beyond words, he cannot speak because he's not permitted to share the content of that revelation. So it's highly private confidential for his eyes and ears only. And so we don't know. Now, why did Paul have this experience? He does explain that. Uh, he says that um, it's to keep him from... Be oh, no, sorry. Correction. We don't know why he has this experience. Yeah, it's private. It's only for him. Maybe it's to edify him. Maybe it's to encourage him and build him up. Um, we only know that it's a supernatural experience, but we don't know why. Okay, And that's really up uh, between him and God. Now, again, using careful reading, we know that this man was caught up to the third heaven and we know he is Paul. Because in verse 7, so remember earlier he said, I know a man. That was third person, right? Then here in verse 7, he switches to first person to keep me from becoming conceited. And so and it's within the same context that he's talking about. So we know then that this man that he's talking about is himself. And now he then talks about this thorn in the flesh. Um, Paul says, it was given me, given by God to him. Now, why? Well, it was specifically tied to seeing the vision. So in the context, again, of the verse, why that thorn was given, it's in context with the vision. He saw the vision, but the thorn is given to prevent him from being proud. Okay, And then in that same breath, Paul also acknowledges that this thorn is a messenger of Satan. So this thorn is both given by God and yet a messenger of Satan. Mm, how can, right? But that does not mean that God sent Satan to torment Paul, all right? No. But if you remember the book of Job, similar, right? God allows Satan, allows Satan to cause affliction. So, so that God prevails in Paul's life. God's power is displayed when Paul submits to God. Okay, what is this thought? Um, many people, many scholars have tried to explain uh, what this thorn could potentially be. And with all the various explanations, um, it's mainly categorized into three types of when, when people talk about what this thorn could potentially be. So some say it's spiritual or psychological. Okay, Maybe it's his emotional turmoil over the churches, or maybe it's his anguish over Israel because of their unbelief. Um, uh, some say it was opposition to his ministry. Maybe it refers to that silversmith in Ephesus that was giving him a lot of trouble. Or in general, a group of opponents like these super apostles in Corinth that were opposing him. 
So opposition, they say this thorn could be opposition. And then the third reason uh, what this thorn could be uh, is it's a physical illness, a physical impairment. Maybe his poor eyesight, maybe uh, a speaking disability, since he did say that, oh, okay, he's not skilled in, as skilled as the, the super apostles in speaking. So, you know, whatever it is, if we're still wondering, what is this vision? What is this thorn? The answer is, that's not the point. We are not to know. And the fact is, Paul doesn't say uh, in his letter. And the vagueness of this thorn actually has helped many people overcome difficult thorns in their own life. It could, and it could be a struggle, a physical struggle like uh, cancer, because these are long drawn. It could be depression. It could be relationship, a difficult relationship with someone uh, that goes on again and again. Or it could be a personal struggle. Um, that you know we have and we see that three times Paul pleaded with God to remove this thorn he didn't ask he said he pleaded with God he begged God please remove it but God said no um, very similar right isn't it to how how Jesus uh, prayed in the garden of Gethsemane to ask God uh, if it's possible take this cup away from me three times um, and no, the, the, the answer is no, there is no other way. Yeah, and God's unexpected response to um, Paul was, you know, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in witness. Now, what does it mean that God's power is made perfect in witness? So God's divine power is able to fully manifest when humans acknowledge their weakness. When there's pride, within, when there's self-sufficiency, reliance on human abilities, our own abilities, there's no space for God's power to be displayed. And, you know, we hinder God's power from being displayed when we rely on our human strength, our own human abilities. And that's why Paul boasts about his weakness, because God's power is revealed when he is weak. And that's what Paul rejoices and wants. Uh, and God's grace is able to help Paul overcome and endure. So the question then for us is, if you have what you consider a thorn, you know, maybe we can pray and discern and ask, what might its purpose be? How are you going to handle it? And I hope that, you know, you'll be encouraged by God's promise that his grace is sufficient for you and his power is made perfect in your weakness. Okay, so then moving on to verses, chapter 12, verses 11 to 13. Um, Paul didn't share or seemingly boast about this supernatural vision that he got from God because the super apostles were boasting. And so, oh, he needed to have a one-up over them. So the, therefore, he boasts about this supernatural uh, 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 experience. No, that was not the case. He, had, he felt that he had to share this and he was feeling foolish about it, having to share, boast about this. But he felt he needed to share this because the Corinthians were listening to these false teachers and they were not trusting Paul. And so, so therefore he had to, to bring it up. And he talked about marks of true apostles um, having signs, wonders and miracles. Now, what's signs, wonders and miracles? That signs are the ability to authenticate a message, right? So when a message is given, there is a sign to show that, yes, this message is true, it's from God. Wonders, wonders are things that evoke awe. It's like, wow, you know, and a sense of awe when people see those wonders happening. And then miracles uh, or mighty deeds, uh, they are the kind that displays a divine power, something that we know it's not humanly possible, something that is supernatural and divine. Okay, so when marks of a true apostle, when there are signs, wonders, and miracles. But there are other marks of uh, true apostles that are not listed here in this chapter 12, verse 12. And Paul does talk about it. For example, um, chapter 11, verse 4, faithfulness to the message. Uh, and 
chapter 10, verse 1, where apostle is one who is willing to follow the example of Christ. Does he or she display the characteristics of, of Christ, the nature of Christ? Okay, so these are marks of the apostles. Now, Paul in, in verse 12 uses irony um, when he, he's saying, yeah, you know, you Corinthians, you're not inferior to other churches, but the difference is that, you know, you, you didn't support me financially whereas other churches supported me financially. But, you know, that's the only part you're inferior or, or you lesser in, okay? And so he was kind of using like an irony to say that uh, you're not inferior. And so this whole section from uh, chapter 11 all the way to half the midpoint, around the midpoint of chapter 12, uh, verse 13, it's really Paul having to address the deception and Paul having to say that, you know, He's not an inferior apostle uh, and he uses, unfortunately, he has to boast about certain things in his life and he boasts also about his weaknesses. Um, but knowing that God's grace is sufficient for him. Okay, so this is this whole uh, section here, the second segment. If you want to anytime, go ahead, get your water uh, stretch and all that. Please go ahead, okay, but I will carry on. Now we come to the last segment, which is uh, from verse 12, half of verse 12, uh, chapter 12, sorry, all the way until chapter 13. Now, Paul then uh, is announcing that he's coming to visit them for the third time. Uh, and his policy is the same, you know, he's not going to be a financial burden on them. He does not want what uh, they, they have or, or share with him. He Rather that they reciprocate his love. You know, show love to me. You don't need to give to me financially. That's what he was saying here. And he uses the analogy of parents are the ones who save and support for their children financially and not the other way around, meaning that he saw himself as their spiritual father uh, and they as his spiritual children. Okay, So parents are the ones who support children, not the other way around. Very Singaporean, right? That's what I think Singaporeans do also. Um, but yeah, so he's using that analogy also to show that he is a spiritual father to them and he sees them as his children. Now, verses 16 to 17, uh, he's saying that, you know, he didn't use trickery as what his opponents are accusing him of doing. So if you read uh, verses 16 all the way to 18, we can infer that there are some rumors from the opponents that's going on about Paul that, oh, you know, this Paul, uh, he's unscrupulous. You know, he exploited the church generosity uh, and he gained financial support from them. But, at, you know, at, at the surface, he says, no, 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 he declines and doesn't accept the money. But, you know, at the behind, uh, his sidekicks and his agents and his kakia will help to take money from him. So we can infer uh, that, you know, it's these thought of something like that, these kinds of uh, uh, rumors and false accusations were going about him. And so therefore, that was what he was addressing. And um, yeah, so he was speaking against this, that this is not true. And verses 17 to 18, he's saying that, you know, even when Titus was sent to them and another brother, uh, not named, not mentioned, he was saying that they too were upright in their conduct and in their principles as well with the Corinthian church. Okay, so he had to uh, speak up about his integrity here and these accusations. Now, verses 19 to 21, um, Paul rejects the idea that, oh, he is defending himself and the Corinthians are the judge. Okay, so the Corinthians are not his judge. That's why he's saying he is accountable to God and God alone. Uh, his self-defense uh, is not to explain himself, but his primary purpose of this defense was to build up, build them up, build the church up, build the Corinthians up. Okay, and he he shares his fears with them. He's coming for the third time soon, uh, and he's he's fearful that you know this letter. Uh, might not be successful because they would still be in sin. There might be discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition. I think he lists them there. Gossip, lots of gossip going around. Arrogance uh, and disorder. He was, he was fearful, you know, that uh, 
these things are, are, are still going to happen when he visits them. He's also fearful uh, that, you know, the Corinthians will still continue believing the super apostles and that they are embarrassed of Paul because he wasn't so eloquent as them. He wasn't, uh, didn't seem to be, uh, you know, he was more meek and, and uh, yeah, seemingly timid according to the super apostles. He was also fearful that he would face another repeat a uh, painful visit, like his second painful visit, where they opposed him. Uh, you know, they were unrepentant and they would continue in sexual sin. And these were some of the his concerns that he's writing to them now that, you know, I'm going to come to you, but I'm fearful that these things are still going on. Then going to chapter 13, uh, verse 1 to 4, he gives them a very severe warning that when he comes on his third visit, He's going to have a formal investigation. So he he uses uh, this part, right? Every fact, he quotes this, every fact is to be confirmed by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Now, this was the usual way of uh, uh, gathering uh, information, investigation, and going to court, right? So a very formal way, gathering witnesses, right? Uh, this was established in the Old Testament times all the way until Jesus and Paul's time. So he's giving them a warning in advance that he will take action and punishment will be taken when he comes to investigate you know, all these false accusations, all this sin, any misdemeanor, uh, any wrongdoings that, that's taking place within the church. And then uh, verse 3 to 4, okay, uh, unfortunately, the Corinthians were immature, and many of us today also, because they were unimpressed by Paul's meekness, his gentleness. And that was, that was like Christ, Christ's meekness and gentleness. And Paul explains that, you know, Christ was crucified because of his own willingness to be weak. Not the, and, you know, the weakness here is not talking about the physical or the moral weakness but rather this meekness and weakness uh, that Christ demonstrated and Paul likewise is demonstrating is actually a non-aggressive, uh, non-retaliation type of obedience to God, okay, uh, towards and, and how he was relating to the Corinthians. So those who follow Christ are weak in humanness, but they seek to obey God. These are the ones, in fact, are strong. And Paul is sustained by God's power and the Holy Spirit. And it is in this power that Paul is going to act out discipline towards the church and those who are in sin. And so he, he, he tells them, uh, rather than questioning his apostleship, you know, examine yourself. Yeah. And here he then says, right, that this spiritual authority that, or authority that he has on them uh, is to build them up and not to tear them down. And he, when he question, asked them to, you know, examine yourself. Now, the Bible says that the heart is deceitful, right? We can trick ourselves. We give excuses. We rationalize. We think that, yeah, we're okay. Right? You know, it's you that's fault. You know, it's, it's other people, everybody else's fault. Not me, I'm okay. Right? Now, how do we know we are walking in Christ? We are in faith. How do we test and examine ourselves? Think about that for a while. Oh, well, I'll come back to this question again. And then Paul then goes into his conclusion, his final appeal. And you know, if you observe Paul's letters, or many of Paul's letters, his appeal to many of the churches that he writes to is always for unity. Yeah, it's always for that unity within the church. And so he ends this part also in his letter uh, for unity within the Corinthian church. He sends his greetings. That's a typical Paul uh, way, or also very much of how letters were written at that time. Greetings uh, where, you know, sends the greetings of the co-workers that are with him. And then he ends off, I'm sure we're very familiar because our pastors also use this, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Uh, a benediction, which is a Trinitarian benediction. You will see that, right? The grace, Christ gives us the grace to grow towards holiness. 
Okay, and the love that God supplies. God is the one who supplies love so that we can love others. And the fellowship or the participation with the Holy Spirit. You now we cooperate with the Holy Spirit to do what He calls us to do. Okay, so together we see the Trinity at work in our lives. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And so the the chapter wrap up for this section is, you know, he is going to have disciplinary action at the next visit. So test yourself, examine yourself. And one of the key things is about authority, spiritual authority. And so I want to talk a little bit about authority here and to go back to chapter 13, verse 10. He says, for this reason, I write these things while I am away from you that when I come, I may not have to be severe in my use of authority that the Lord has given me for building up and not for tearing down. Now, let's look at this word authority, exousia. Uh, some of the, the uh, definition of this word um, is that you know it is a state of control over something. Okay, or it is a freedom of choice of right, of your right, the right to act or the, the, the right to decide for one's wishes. Okay, so the, the more authority, the person with greater authority has maximum freedom of choice, right? Because nobody tells me what to do. I can do anything with, for a person who has the highest authority. But the person who is under authority, he has limited freedom. Because the person who has authority over him uh, has to, uh, will say what you can, cannot do, right? Yeah. So the secret of spiritual authority is that it creates rather than limits the other person's freedom of choice. So here when Paul was saying that, uh, you know, he, he's writing to them with the authority that God gave him, that the Lord gave him. Now, if you remember Jesus' words when he was with his disciples and he says that and Christ said that you know the the Gentiles they lord it over right they rule over don't be like that uh, as what the Gentiles do but rather be a servant right serve uh, now Paul did not lord it over the Corinthians like how the Gentiles did it, but rather he pointed them back to what Christ had done and Christ was doing to give them freedom. Because remember the context, uh, the false teachers were mixing Judaism practices and those were the law and all that, right? And so Paul was trying to tell them, you know, don't turn away from that, turn away from this false teaching. Those uh uh, the law condemns. Remember earlier chapters we talked about when Paul talks about compared with the, the law and the, the letter of the Spirit, right? And that's freedom. And so even though Paul is exercising spiritual authority over the church, he only actually mentions it only twice uh, at the end of this letter at chapter 10, verse 8, and chapter 13, verse 10. And he recognizes that the giver of this authority is the Lord. And the purpose of exercising this authority over the church is to build them up, not to tear them down, not to destroy them. And Paul wants to free them so that they can choose to obey God and choose God's way willingly. That was the kind of spiritual authority that he was having over them. Now, if you look at your notes, you have this diagram. And I came across this and I thought this was rather interesting. Now, chain of command type of authority is very typical uh, in companies, in military, in org charts, um, right? And so we might then impose that kind of chain of command type of authority in the church. And we think that, okay, yeah, there's God. And then there's the leader who, who is under the authority of God. And then there's the follower who is under the authority of the leader. Um, but biblical authority is... The fact that the leader, yes, is so-called above the follower, but he's not between the follower, the individual, and God. They are both uh, submit 
to the Lordship of Christ. Okay? And Christ is over both of them. And the leader leads, but the leader does not control. Now, in practice then, what does then that look like? In practice, the leader then humbles himself in order to elevate others. And so he walks alongside the follower. And both are still under the authority of the Lord. But the leader then encourages, um, you know, and rather than command, request, encourage, work alongside the follower, both of them being under the Lordship of Christ. Okay, so that is a biblical practice of authority. Now then, if you look at this and understand this then, think about those of us who are, those of you who are in leadership positions and have spiritual authority over others. Say, for example, maybe you are a ministry leader uh, maybe you are a team leader in one of your ministries, like Asha Lead or, or you know, a WMM team leader. Or you are CGL, assistant CGL, pastors. You are a parent. Parents have spiritual authority over your children. Now, how are you building up and not tearing down uh, those whom you are leading? Rather than trying to, you know, tighten control, to control... How can we help those that you lead find freedom in Christ such that we are leading them to submit to the Lordship of Christ rather than submitting to you who are our leaders? Are you humbling yourself in order to elevate other people up? And the appropriate um, attitude of a leader is one of a servant, one who humbles himself, one who is willing to put aside you know, status, symbols, power, but relies on the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, coming back to the other question earlier I had, how would you test and examine yourself to know if you are in a faith and Christ is truly in you? Okay, so coming back to this, in relation to spiritual authority. So in the context of spiritual authority, um, there are some who are spiritual leaders, but what about those of us who have spiritual leaders over us? So we have our CGLs, we have our parents, our pastors, our ministry leaders, our mentors, etc. All these spiritual leaders who are uh, leading us. Now, do we say like the Corinthians, oh, prove yourself to me first lah, before I listen to you. You know, uh, do we not realize that we are actually accountable to God and we are submitting to the Lordship of Christ rather than to men? Our deeds, our actions are the ones that will prove our genuine faith. Not our feelings, not what we think. It's about our deeds and our actions. So for example, if our spiritual leaders, right, um, our CGLs, our pastors and leaders, they call us out and they hold us accountable to our deeds and our actions or our lack of it. Do we give excuses? Do we get angry, offended? Yeah, why he keep asking me to come for CG? Yeah. I cannot lie. I don't want to be tired after work. No. But they are holding us accountable to our deeds. Um, are we upset? Or do we realize that their spiritual authority over us is to bring us towards submission to Christ's lordship over our lives? That we will choose, we'll have that freedom to choose Christ uh, over our earthly desires or our willful disobedience. So then really it is to test ourselves and to ask ourselves, yeah, our, our deeds and our actions then showing and proving our genuine faith. And when we have our leaders walking alongside with us, holding us accountable, um, are we then uh, working alongside with our spiritual leaders to see that they are helping us submit to Christ rather than we see that, oh, yeah, they are such a nuisance or, you know, I don't want to listen to our leaders, the spiritual leaders. Okay, so something for us to think about from those who are in the leadership perspective and those who are have leaders over us. Okay, so in summary, this third section uh, of uh, you know when Paul is talking about the future, his coming, his warning to the church from verses uh, chapters ten to thirteen. Okay, so this is all the so-called. Mm, summary statements that you have. I would encourage you, please don't copy this, don't take this as, you know, it is correct, but craft your own, 
okay? Craft your own summary statements and themes for each chapter because then that's where it will help you remember uh, better as well.